Hello everyone, let's try to be a cheat code ninja today. Through this problem, we are going to learn a new concept called as dynamic programming. And there are multiple ways to solve a DP problem. And we'll be going through two solutions for this. Let's look at it. In this problem, we are given a matrix of size n by n. And we have to return the minimum sum of any falling path in the matrix. A falling path can start at any element in the first row. And then we can choose any of the three elements from the below row, the diagonally left, the diagonally right, and the directly below cell. For example, after choosing one, we can choose either of the three elements, the diagonally left element 6, the directly below element 5, and the diagonally right element 4. Let's look at the example given. We are given the shortest falling path which starts at 1, and then we choose 5, and then 7. The total of this path is 13 and we can verify that there is no other path which has a sum less than 13. For example, if we choose a path 2, 5 and 7, the total is 14. And if we choose this path 2, 6 and 8, the total will be 16. There is another path with the sum as 13, 1, 4 and 8. But since we are concerned only with the sum of the path and not the path itself, our answer will still be 13. Let's try to come up with an intuitive solution for this. Let's look at the same example as given in the problem. As per the problem statement, when we choose an element, we have three choices. We can choose an element which is directly below or it is to the diagonally right or left. In this case, there is no diagonally left possible, so we will not consider it. And we have to repeat this process for each of those individual elements. For example, if we choose 5, then these three elements will be available for us in the next choice. And when we reach the last row, there are no rows below, so we can stop. And this process has to be repeated for each element in each row. And if we choose the corner element either at the left or at the right, then only two choices will be available for us in the next row. Let's try to represent this using a decision tree. We'll initially begin at the first row and then choose any of the three elements. Once we have chosen that, we have three choices. We can choose any of the three permitted values in the below row. And then for each of those three elements, we'll have three independent choices. We can choose an element which is at the left, below or to the right. And then once we reach the elements at the bottom row, we cannot go down any further, so we'll have to compute our answer. So we'll calculate the sum of the path that we have taken. And once we have computed the sum of each path that is possible, we'll find the minimum of those sums and that will be our answer. For example, if we take this path, then the sum would be 15. If we would take a different path, then the sum would be 16. And for this path, the sum would be 14. This is the minimum that we have seen so far. So the other sums are not useful to us. If we take this path, then the sum would again be 16. And out of all the paths, the minimum falling path would be this path. The sum would be 13. Similarly, even this is a minimum falling path. Because even this has the same sum. So to solve this, we could write a recursive logic where we return the sum of the current value and the minimum of the three choices that we can make and at the bottom row, since we cannot make any choice, we can just directly return their value as the answer. If this part is not clear, don't worry, we'll cover it again after a while. Let's try to think about the time complexity of this. Initially, at the first row, there are n elements we can start from and for each of those n elements, we have three choices. And we have to repeat the process of making three choices at each level of the tree. And the total number of levels will be n. So the time complexity would be for each of the n elements at the top row, there will be 3 raised to the power n decision trees. This time complexity is exponential and we'll have to optimize it. Let's again take the same example. Let's suppose we just had only one row, which is the bottom row. Now for any element in this row, we cannot make further choices. 
so the sum of the following path from it would be its value similarly for the other two elements in the row the following path starting from there would be their values let's try to use this base condition to solve our problem now if we consider the last two rows together for each element in the second last row we'll again have three choices and if you notice carefully we have already computed the following path starting from the elements at the row below the following path starting at each element at the second last row only depends on the computed following paths for the row below in order to minimize the following path we should be choosing the minimum following path for the three choices below hence for this element it makes sense to consider only this path so the minimum falling path starting at 6 would be the sum of 6 and the minimum of falling path among the three choices below this will become more clear in a while as we calculate the falling path for the first row similarly for the next element 5 we only have to look at the three falling paths and the falling path starting at 5 would be the sum of 5 and the minimum of the three falling paths for 4 we just have two choices we should choose the path which leads to the minimum falling path so the falling path starting at 4 would be the sum of 4 and 8 now let's consider the top row of the matrix the falling path for each of its elements depends upon all the rows below but actually we have already pre computed the falling path starting at each element of the second row so we only need to use that pre computed result and we don't need to compute everything again till the last row This is all the information that we require to solve the following path for the first row. For each element, we'll again have three choices. We should choose a path leading to a minimum falling path. So we'll choose this path. We'll use the pre-computed result and add it to two to get the falling path starting at two. Similarly, we'll have three choices for the path starting at one. We'll choose the minimum of them. There are two such paths, so we can choose any of them. we'll use the pre computed result and add it to 1 to get the falling path starting at 1 similarly for 3 we'll look at the two paths below and choose the one which leads to a minimum falling path since both of them are same we can choose any of them and the falling path starting at 3 would be 15 now we have computed the falling path starting at each element in the first row and since we can start at any of these elements we'll find the minimum of these and start over there that will be our answer there are two approaches to implement the solution we have discussed let's look at the first one in this approach we'll try to compute the following path for the elements in the first row and since that value depends on the following path for the three elements in the below row we'll first compute them and since they themselves depend upon the following path for the next row we'll call the same recursive function for the three elements below and when we reach the last row there are no more elements left below so the falling path would be the value itself and once we have the falling path computed for the last row we can use those values to compute the falling path for the second last row the falling path for an element would be the sum of its value and the minimum of the three falling paths below for the element 5 the three falling paths from below would be 7 8 and 9 we'll choose the minimum of them and add it to 5 similarly for 6 we'll consider these two falling paths we'll choose the minimum of them which is 7 and the falling path at 6 would be 6 plus 7 similarly the falling path at 4 would be 12 we'll now repeat the same process for the top row for the element 1 we'll consider the minimum of the three falling paths and add it to 1 so this would be 13 similarly the falling path at 3 would also be 13 and the falling path at 2 would be 14 and now out of all these three falling paths we'll choose the minimum one and that will be our answer since in this approach we start at the top and keep on calling the same function recursively for each of its children this is known as a top down approach we can cache the results of the smaller sub problems that we have solved and reuse them this approach is known as memoization this is a very handy technique to solve dynamic programming problems let's look at a second approach which is very similar to this in this approach we start at the bottom row and as we have already seen that for the bottom row 
the results are already computed it is the same as the value or sub problem is already solved now we'll use this solution to solve the problem for the second last row for each element over here we'll be looking at three elements below and we'll be choosing the minimum of them we'll use the pre-computed result and add it to the value of that element similarly let's fill this out for the other two elements and now since we have computed the result for this row we don't have to look at the last row please note that this is an opportunity to optimize space by implementing a solution this way if this part is not clear don't worry we'll be covering many more dp problems and this optimization would be covered in detail then similarly we'll calculate the following path for the first row using the values computed for the second row we'll choose the minimum of the results computed for the first row and that will be our answer in this approach we initially start at the bottom row and we use its result to calculate the values for the upper rows hence this approach is also known as a bottom up approach and in the case of dp problems this solution is known as a dynamic programming solution the time complexity of this solution would be o of n square because we have to go through the elements only once and the space complexity would be o of n square when we are using the memoization approach this is because we'll cache the results for each element in the matrix and the space complexity would be constant in the case of dynamic programming solution this is because we can modify the input array and store the results over there let's implement our solution let's first implement the memoization solution let's keep a variable to store the number of rows and columns in the matrix let's define a hash map to cache the results for a recursive function We'll now define our recursive DFS function which takes the row and the column as an input. We'll handle the case when in order to access the diagonally left or right elements we are exceeding the boundaries of the matrix. To handle that condition gracefully we'll return an infinity. So this will never be considered as our answer. We'll handle the case when we have reached the last row of the matrix. Since we cannot call DFS anymore we'll return the value of the cell. We'll now check if we have already cached the result for this row and column. We'll directly return it. Let's keep a variable to store our current value. The following path for the current cell would be the sum of the current value and the minimum of the following paths for the three elements in the next row. So we'll call the same DFS function for the i plus 1 row and the same column for the element directly below. For the diagonally left cell, we'll call it on i plus 1 row and j minus 1 column. And for the diagonally right cell, we'll call it on i plus 1 row and j plus 1 column. And at the end, we'll cache this result so that it can be reused. Now, a recursive function is finished and we just have to return the cached value. We'll initialize our result to be plus infinity. And now we'll calculate the following path for each element in the top row. And the minimum of that will be our answer. So we'll call DFS on the 0th row and the jth column. At the end, we can return our answer. Our top-down approach is now complete. Let's look at the bottom-up approach. Let's keep a variable to store the number of rows and columns in the matrix. We already have the results computed for the last row. So we'll start from the second last row and go till the 0th row. Hence, we are using a reversed operator. We have to go through all the elements in that row. And for each element, we'll have to take the minimum of the diagonally left, the diagonally right, and the directly below falling paths. For the case when we are at the 0th column, then the diagonally left element won't exist. So we'll store a plus infinity in that case. Similarly, when we are at the last column, then the diagonally right element cannot exist. So we'll be storing a plus infinity in that case. Now we'll also keep a variable for the directly down element. And once we have those three values, we'll have to take the minimum of these three and we'll have to add this value to the value of our current cell. So now we have computed the falling path value for our current cell and we have saved it in the same matrix itself. At the end, our answer would be the minimum of the falling paths for the elements in the first row. We'll directly return this. Let's submit our solution. Our solution is accepted. If you have any doubts or concerns regarding this solution, please mention in the comments. 
If you thought this video was helpful, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more such content. Thanks for watching.